Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Blast Motion Podcast. My name is Kyle Adel, and today we have a very special guest in Jeff Albert. Jeff Albert is well known in the hitting community, particularly at the big league and major league level. He was the Astros minor league hitting coordinator. He was the Astros second hitting coach in the big leagues. He spent some years as the Cardinals big league hitting coach and is now the director of hitting from the New York Mets. He just opened his own facility, Hit 585, in Rochester and is also the home of HittingResearch.com. If you do not follow this guy on Twitter or social media and have seen his stuff, we highly recommend you do so. We're going to get into some great topics today around some of the differences and similarities he sees in training big leaguers and youth players, uh, how drills should speak for themselves, how self-organization and constraint-based training can streamline development and really allow hitters to learn fundamentals and add their own personal style into it. And then how to keep things both simple and effective in the training process. We're going to have a lot of great stuff today, so let's tune in. This will be another great episode. Jeff, thank you so much for joining. I was so excited to have you on today. How are we doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm glad to see what you guys are doing with this podcast. You know, I've been, you know, knowing you for a long time, know a lot of people at Blast, um, you know, from the very, very early days and been, uh, been kind of a big part of what I've been doing for a long time. So, you know, happy to be on. Yeah, we're happy to have you. You are, correct me if I'm wrong, you're over at Hit uh, hit 585 for HittingResearch.com. How's that new facility going? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, it's it's brand new. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It's kind of like a lot of the stuff that I have in my mind and working on, like having an outlet and a place to do it um, and train with players at all levels, like amateur, pro guys, different things like that that are around here. Um, so it's been really great to do. The, the website started a while ago reviewing research. So that uh, the website's called HittingResearch.com. And then the, the application of it really happens here. So what I really like in, in my career um, is consuming the information, like especially objective information. There's a lot of great information out there, especially most of the stuff I'm posting on, it's free. Like you can Google it basically um, and see what researchers and people are doing to try to measure different parts of the swing. I love knowing that information because what I feel like I've been able to do well over the years is take the information and help players figure out how to apply it in here uh, and reach their their goals on the baseball field. So um, that's a lot of fun for me. That's awesome. So we're excited to hear all about it. I think we want to dive into our first topic. You coach anyone from an amateur player in the youth market to the minor leagues with your experience and even on a big league field and a big league dugout. What are some of the differences or similarities in how you go about the training process for those different levels of play? Uh, any differences or similarities about how you go about it? That's a great question. So I was actually talking about that with someone on the way here. So the way I kind of look at it, so I'll, I'll, we'll maybe reference like CrossFit a lot because that's kind of a, like workouts I like to do. But one thing that I like in that environment is they'll have a, a workout or um, and they'll can, can scale it based on age, ability level, that kind of thing. So the way I view that in baseball is that there's going to be variation based on skill level um, or a degree, but not really based on the, the fundamentals or the kind of things that we do. So um, we have um, eight year old teams that are in here, 12 year old teams, college players doing assessments. And, you know, in, in my day job, it's uh, professional players, major league players. Um, but the fundamentals that we talk about are very, very similar. Hey, here's how your body's designed to move. Here's how the hips move. Uh, like in general, and then here's where you are specifically so we can kind of individualize or customize that to you. So if we can understand the general principles are first, then we can customize. So that idea that um, fundamentals are few, but methods are many. Uh, I think you, it's hard to have one without the other. You can really nail down the methods of what you want to do with the player if you're really clear on what those fundamentals are. So I think that's the way I look at it kind of from a macro or from a big picture is that I want to get young kids on the road to those fundamentals early on, um, and they can kind of individualize or customize it as they go. But I think the concepts are not really that different in the way I talk to them with youth players or major league players, but maybe um, the, the, the variation in the, the words that I might use, the information, the technology. So the delivery of the information and maybe the uh, delivery or application of the drills, those are the things that are going to change a little bit based on the level. 
Yeah, I love that. The foundation of everything stays the same. We're teaching fundamentals and finding it going from there. You've got a lot of drills. If you do, if you don't follow Jeff, you definitely should. It's an automatic <laughs> follow. He's got so much great stuff. You post drills. You've got older kids, younger kids. You've got these uh, training environments. You've got different types of tools you're using. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the drills and how they kind of, I think you said, speak for themselves or how you get guys to self-organize and use constraint-based yeah. training. You talk about some of the drills that you do and some of the tools that you do and then what those uh, specifically work on for, for athletes. Yeah, it's kind of cool now to see the, um, the growth or development in this area because you see a lot more coaches talk about um, motor learning, skill acquisition. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, that wasn't really happening um, in baseball or that wasn't my experience, but now you see it a lot more. So, you know, I've been publishing or posting about like kind of implicit drills or implicit training, um, kind of meaning like the drill just kind of does the it, it does the work for you versus explaining where you're just giving a lot of verbal instruction. And I think um, personally, one of the things that's kind of switched over time is uh, try to lead with the implicit and find the drill that maybe kind of works. And uh, again, it's not one or the other, but I'll try to lead with implicit and find that maybe the movement solution or whatever you want to call it, and then fill in the why as you go, instead of like overloading the player with all this information and do this, do that. Um, because now you're kind of overloaded and you're thinking about a million different things while you're trying to maybe do a different drill or move something. So I feel like it's almost like remove some of the clutter. If you can just get to some of the action first and then backfill on the explanation as you go, uh, it's a little bit different approach, but I really, I, you know, I started to do that maybe in the, 2016, 2017 range, especially when I started kind of learning a little bit more about what drills we were doing and how using, you know, blast sensors and things like that. So the more I learned about what we we're doing and how and why, the more I could kind of manipulate and change the drill, uh, again, both for the big group of players and then individually. So that's been a big kind of change in my approach. And so I think, you know, what I'm trying to do, especially with my website, social media is put out where some of the information comes from. So I'm thinking one, I'm not sure if I published this one yet, but there's one that talks about the differences in the swings for youth players. And so one thing that youth players will basically do more is like the, the ones I'm posting on bat drag, like youth players will basically drop their elbow more. You'll see the back elbow trail really inside on the blast. That may be something like a low early connection or a long time to contact. Um, and so if you know that you see that and you can measure that, then you can start adjusting the, the drills that you do. So one that I just showed was just kind of changing where the player had the bat and he started on his shoulder and uh, the bat position, the bat drag kind of cleaned itself up. So um, it, it helps make a little bit more educated guess on what drill might be effective with the player. And then you could use the feedback from something like a blast sensor, high speed video, whatever the case may be, to like confirm, hey, is this drill really doing what I want? Or no, this drill really isn't doing what I want. Um, I know coaching wise, that's the thing that I really want to nail down is that intervention or that player plan specific to that player. So is this drill really doing what I think it's doing? So are we making progress in the direction that we want? Because sometimes they don't transfer immediately to the game, um, but you gotta kind of know, hey, let's stick with this. We think it's good. We've got some uh, leading indicators, like we're doing things in the cage that we think are gonna transfer in the long run versus, hey, there's just one drill that I like and I'm doing with this player and it's not really working. So I think having a little bit more information on both sides, uh, both in the kind of research background or objective information, and then kind of measuring what you're doing helps lead to some more informed decisions about the coaching process. Yeah, I love the indiv uh, individuality of each player too, figuring out what works best for them. I think some of our listeners would really appreciate, like, could you walk through maybe one, two, or three drills that you would think about doing maybe with a first-time hitter that you've been working with for the first time or some of your go-tos? I think uh, we get a lot of good feedback on some takeaways that they can specifically do. I think bat on the shoulder was one that you had talked about. Is there anything else you'd be willing to share kind of straight up what you are doing drill wise? Well, I think the two that I posted mo most recently are young players around that like 12 to 13 range that capture, I mean, this happens at higher levels too. So I think those two kind of really capture um, a lot of things that happen uh, in one of them. So I put the side by side, the drill that we did, I'll kind of back up a little bit, was just narrow feet and split stance. Um, and then we just choked up on the bat a little bit. So basically like we, we took away 
uh, some of the movement of the lower half and um, essentially fixed the position so the center of gravity was closer to the front foot. That kind of cleaned up the lower half position and the lower body position. And that basically let the player, um, you know, have a essentially a better swing path. So he kind of nailed a lot of things in one shot, which is great. So the lower half position rotation improved and then the, the bat position. So he went from like a, uh, kind of casting, dragging, release the bat early to like a shorter, kind of more connected, good swing path and no rollover. But that all came from one drill to, um, basically like eliminate wasted movement and just get the core foundation of the swing, which I would basically say is, is happening, you know, from about the time the foot lands, um, not even until contact, there's about a 10th of a second from the time the foot lands to the time the, the, the rotation of the body reaches full speed. Uh, this I first kind of learned about in the, the physics of baseball. I posted on that where Adair in the physics of baseball is basically saying, everything after that first tenth of a second is a reaction to what happened earlier on. Um, so that kind of changed my thought process on, all right, this pre-swing movement, the position I get into, the way I start my swing is very, very important. But most of the time, the feedback that I see or I know that I was giving to players is on something that's happening after that. So a lot of times we're talking about or we're, we're addressing things that happen at contact or finish. Um, and those are symptoms or something that's related to something that happened earlier in the swing. Um, and, and then uh, there was another player that was, you know, I did it from this angle where, you know, he had a stride and his hands were farther away and the bat was basically higher, um, basically like higher than the line of the shoulders. So you could see the bat kind of dropping below the line of the shoulders. So it went from high or like high early connection in the blast world to low early connection and then kind of rolled over. And I just had him start with his hands lower so the bat was closer to the shoulders. So he's already starting in a more aligned position. So now his first move um, became like more direct to the ball because he basically started his swing on plane. So he, get, he got the bat in a more efficient position and that cleaned up his swing path, his rotation, his efficiency, you name it. So I like things for, like that, especially for young players with maybe multiple things going on to eliminate some of the noise or the unnecessary movement and really try to help identify, hey, this is the core of the swing. This is like hitting position. This is how to use your body to move from hitting position to contact. This is what it means to connect your bat or your arms to your rotating body. And, um, you know, the word that I would use for that is just alignment. So here's how to get the bat and the arms aligned to your body and get this thing moving as one functional piece or one functional unit. Um, and again, so I tried to, to post, I thought, what were simple uh, actions with a couple players that that's really in, in those two posts, that's one that's one hour or, you know, really just 20 minutes of work. Hey, I've seen a couple swings and then, hey, let's try this drill. So that happened within a few minutes, which, you know, viewers can't really see. But to get to that simplicity or let's try this drill, let's try that drill. That's like, hey, here's a concept that I've been thinking about and now measuring with Blast for a long time. And, you know, based on that experience and information, that changes my ability uh, to apply it. So, um, again, like having that research information, being able to use it, measure it with experience, I think that has like accelerated my, uh, my coaching process. That's awesome. You know, just for everybody listening, uh, Jeff had mentioned early connection with that starting position. That's one of our blast metrics with kind of where the bat and the body are starting in that position. You had mentioned, yeah, perfect. Just like that, the shoulder or the bat angle to the spine angle, making sure that we're right there. It really helps get on plane, which what is what he was mentioning. Jeff, you were talking a lot about kind of what we like to describe as like constraint based drills where it's promoting yeah. a good movement and preventing a bad movement. We get this question a lot and I'd be curious to get your take on it. You know, some people think that speed and intent can help with fundamentals uh, or you could flip it and you can say, all right, let's get the movement down and then speed it up. Do you fall on one side or the other? Or do you think that it's kind of like a balance between what you're seeing with the athlete? Do we use speed to get yeah. technique or do we get technique and then speed it up? Well, I think the real answer to that is your job as the coach is to figure out where the player is on that spectrum. 
and then how to manage all those things. I think that's why you want the information about what's important, what, you know, that's why you want to understand about what blocked random and serial practices. That's why you want to know about mechanics. That's why you want to know about weighted implement training. That's why you want to be able to measure all that stuff because your ability to kind of program or manipulate those factors, that's your job or your skill as the coaches. Without that information, you're probably just guessing more. Um, so I'll give you kind of two examples. Personally, uh, the bat speed training helped me and hurt me. So this is 20 years old. This is why I transferred from a division three school to a division one school. My coach told me, hey, you're not gonna play because you don't hit for any power and you're a corner guy. We need a guy to hit for more power. So I, um, this is like Paul Nyman, set pro back in the early 2000s. This is over 20 years ago. So weighted implement training, bat speed training, you name it. And so I started doing that and I had a huge improvement in the bat speed in the first three to four weeks. I ended up, you know, earning a spot on the team, playing every day, becoming a starter, all that kind of stuff. But at, at that time, my swing was very like mechanical and robotic. So high intensity bat speed training, that not only helped my bat speed, but that kind of cleaned up my mechanics without me knowing anything about my mechanics. So the intent got me like more fluid, load, unload. I had this little mini leg kick going. Like that made my mechanics really good. And even though I wasn't thinking about mechanics at all. Now, the next year, I kind of went too far with it and I got some bad habits because I started, hey, if I'm kind of forward and like swinging down, that helped my bat speed go up. But that really hurt my swing and my swing path because I was creating some more bat speed. But now I'm just hooking everything to shortstop. And, you know, I didn't know enough about how to kind of get my body in the right position and get my swing path the right spot to get that combination of you want bat speed, but you got to be able to hit. You know, like, so the bat speed and power in particular for the swing is important, but that bat speed and power has to happen in a very specific time frame and a very specific position. So I don't think you can have position independent from speed or power or quickness. You have to manage all of those variables in a way that optimizes performance for the hitter on the field, which is op uh, ultimately the most important outcome. So I don't think you can train just for bat speed or just for quickness or one for power. They're all components or ingredients to this outcome that you want to see on the field. Um, so I went through that myself 20 years ago, navigating that through college and spending a lot of time trying to learn about what happened. Um, I'll give you another one with basically my son who's 12 years old and he's big for tall and like he's my height. Um, you know, I'm five, nine. And so he's tall and skinny for a 12 year old and he's had speed. And he's kind of learned mechanics and like coordination and movement along the way. But, you know, he probably got more into baseball within the last year or two. But basically because of his size, I've always had things for him where he's had a chance to essentially swing fast. There's, um, I forgot what book this in, but there's a, I'm thinking of this picture, a quote from Jack Nicholas That's like talking to, talking to kids and, and just saying, hey, bomb it. And I'm thinking of like, um, I think it was Greg Rose and TPI that are kind of talking about the window of opportunities from eight to 14 years old physically, where like, hey, let's get the speed going. Um, and so if you do that, I know for him, there's gonna be times where he does that, where the swing gets off and the swings maybe a little bit longer or in slide or a little bit draggy. Um, and then I think what I see publicly sometimes is we say one or the other, but I was thinking about this and like programming, the volume of swings that he takes in the course of a week those very high intensity where you have high intensity and and you're trading off some accuracy you know speed accuracy the volume of the high intensity swings is so much lower than the volume of kind of swings where he's like working on a drill or just hitting batting practice so if you think about that like sets and reps in the gym if you're really doing high intensity bat speed you can't have a lot of volume with that because the intensity is going to fatigue you faster. That's like if you're doing, you know, bench press and you're doing your one rep max, that's the high intensity. You can only do one rep. If you can do 10 reps or 12 reps or 15 reps, you're not working at a high enough intensity to get that speed that you want in your swing. So, you know, by definition in the strength conditioning world, if you're going higher intensity for bat speed, you're going to have to come down on the volume. And if your swing gets off a little bit, you want drills or other parts of your program that can offset that and kind of keep you on track where you're not going off the rails with a high a high bat speed swing and can't make contact or a beautiful looking swing and great looking mechanics but you can't hit the ball the infield you got to figure out a way to combine them all
Yeah, that's awesome. I think a lot of times too, we talk about using drills to create progressions for hitters where when they are getting ready to compete, they're not only doing drills that have helped them, but are something that are warming them up, getting them calibrated and kind of ready to rock from there. Uh, That's all amazing stuff. Uh, Thank you for sharing some of those drills. I think I want to talk about this last topic, kind of the simpleness and effectiveness that you have. I think back to Slugfest in 2019. I always remember this presentation that you gave. (laughs) You went up there. You're the only guy that didn't have slides. You didn't have notes. You just stood up there. Um, Yeah, I'm going to tee you up for this, and then you go feel free to talk (laughs) however you want. But you took us all through this simple exercise We were all just sitting in our chairs right there, and it really hit home with so many people. And I think it came down to how you were able to simplify it. And you talked about in your position at the time, you had so many hitters and so many coaches you were responsible for. You really had to get everybody on the same page with verbiage and what everyone was actually trying to do. Um, With you here, I just can't not bring that up and have you talk about it. Is that something you still implement today? Has it changed you know, how do you go about it? We've talked about, you know, a couple kids in the cage individually. There are people that listen to this podcast that coach teams of, you know, maybe one age group or two age groups. And then we've got people that are responsible for large organizations. You know, what do you say to them in implementing some of this type of stuff? Being simple is not always simple. And so I appreciate you bringing that up about the not having slides because I'm like, oh man, all right. Every presentation, every clinic I go to, slides and all that stuff. And I used to have that too. And I still do the same thing. And I've spent all these times making my slides look nice. But, you know, if you have nice slides, but somebody doesn't remember it, then maybe that's missing something. And so I know big picture at that time, I was like, okay, I want to deliver a presentation that can live on its own. Like you can remember it and what we did and how, and not only have the concept, but the action to go along with it. And that's my real view of simplicity because there's a ton of research and information behind what we did, which was a progression for um, hip rotation, torso rotation, and then connecting that to swing path and then the entire swing. So that was a progression that was basically designed to say, if you took anybody off the street, so if anybody walking by the facility right now, if I just grabbed them and pulled them in here and then had to show them how to go from, you know, never swinging a bat to moving in rotation with swing plane, like how would you do that? So like, how do you have a progression that's kind of um, founded on some objective information about how the body works that you can also uh, basically turn into drills? So you can progress that into T, soft toss, flips or whatever, but we have, we can take the bat away and just have this basic progression the mo- at the most basic level for how to move. So m- most of the time when the players come in here, we kind of start with that progression, eight, 12 year olds, which was basically like hip flexion, internal rotation to get the hips loading. So hip flexion, internal rotation, then extend and rotate, and that's hip rotation. And then we're basically just gonna go up in the shoulder rotation. We're gonna keep that same action with the hips and get the back going in line with the shoulders and then connect that to two hands. And you don't need a fancy, if you understand that, and those are, those are the basic movements of the swing, um, that doesn't mean that you have to hit with a flat bat or like whatever. There's no magic early connection number. There's no magic on plane number that's gonna make you a major league hitter, but that's combining the fundamentals of how, the, it's not mechanics. It's this is what your body's designed to do. This is the way your hips are designed to move. This is the position that your bat wants to get into. All right, so here's those fundamentals. Here's where you are relative. And then we have tools that help us kind of connect those dots and figure out which drills do what. So that presentation was like my shot at, you know, saying these are what I think those, these are what I have found those fundamentals to be. And if you strip away all the drills and all the different methods that you see out here, um, social media and whatnot, like what are the core principles of the swing that we can teach? That was a large group. That was like two, 300 coaches, pro coaches, college coaches. That was pretty awesome, yeah. you know, event. And it's like, how can you get a room that big very quickly on the same page? And so what I found in my professional career and now here working with amateur players and amateur teams, if you can identify and clarify those core fundamentals, then you can get a group of people literally on the same page. You can't get on the same page if you don't identify what that page is. So getting on the same page and now we're moving and we're moving collectively in the same direction versus just everybody's on a different page 
um, and, and not really able to agree on what they think those core fundamentals are. So, you know, that was that presentation was like, you know, my shot at trying to summarize that. Yeah. One of my, I think one of my favorite quotes is uh, simple doesn't mean easy, you know, and you took something that was definitely not easy and you made it simple. And that whole room walked away. I, I talked to anybody that was there and they still always remember that presentation. Yeah, so that. Um, just amazing stuff on what we're kind of talking about. Uh, we're going to have to talk about this because I know everyone's going to ask, what is that bat you're holding in your hand? You got markers coming out the bottom. If you can explain that as much as you can. I know that involves a little bit on the pro data side, which uh, Jeff and I are very familiar with. But if you can just give us a little bit of, of basics on that, if you just can, I know we're going to get that question. Okay. So when I was, this was early on. Now you can do this. I think the app is called uh, it's like Pro Physics Toolbox. So if you go in your app store on your phone and uh, get that app, um, it will it will kind of do, it, this is basically trying to understand like, what, what does the sensor measure? What does it do? Um, so there's like three planes, you know, up and down, that's the blue. Um, red, that's towards home plate and green is towards the pitcher. So that's kind of the, the sensor is measuring that. So um, that's going to like the rotational ac acceleration or the on plane is going to be affected by how the knob moves. Mm. So for example, if the, the red and the green, the red towards home plate, if I'm here and I'm rotating this way, it's like the red and the green are accelerating at the same rate. That player is probably going to have a pretty good on plane connection numbers are going to be close to 90, that type of thing. If that is changing. So my bats vertical or my bats too flat. Now, for example, or if I'm, I'm pushing my hands to the pitcher, now my green's accelerating and my red isn't, or if I'm getting too flat, maybe the red is accelerating at a different rate than the green. That's going to tell you, like those numbers are reflected in like your connection numbers, your on plane, your rotational acceleration. So kind of understanding a little bit more about what the sensor was trying to do, um, you know, measure in the planes from the pitcher to home plate, and then basically up and down that kind of helped me understand what the metrics were trying to tell me. And then I feel like if the more I can understand about that, the more I can figure out what the drills are doing and what they weren't trying to do. And one little one that threw me off for a while, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, was it's a gyroscope for rotation and an accelerometer. So the, for example, the, the moving in the direction to home plate or the pitcher was throwing me off for a while because I was thinking how much, not how fast on the accelerometer. So there was one player I'm thinking of in particular that had a lower on plane, but absolutely raked, like really, really good player. And it always threw me off, but that player made kind of just like a quick move. The bat always looked on plane, but he made like a little bit of a quick move, like to start out a swing. So short swing, kind of quick move like that, which I don't think the blast sensor really liked in terms of his on plane, even though like eye test, video, contract rate, all those things were really good. So Again, this is what I mean about the numbers aren't judgments. Like there's no blast number that's going to say you're, you're a major league player or you're not. They're just telling you a story about what you're doing. And I kind of look at it as like pieces of the puzzle or pieces of information. And I want to get all the puzzle pieces that I can about that player so I can put together a more complete picture of maybe what is going to help that player in the long run. I love that you said that. We always talk about being a good tool in the toolbox. You know, uh, you can't build a whole house with a screwdriver, but you're definitely sure. going to need one. And we're a huge part of that. Um, you had mentioned some metrics. Let's just go ahead and end with this. What are some of your favorite blast metrics? I know we just got into the whole pro side. So if you're on the pro side, feel free to reach out to myself or Jeff to talk about that. But we do summarize all that information in some of our key metrics. What are some of your go-to blast metrics? Um, um, yeah. I mean, on planes, my baby, that's like, yeah, <laughs> um, that's, you know, Expected I just that. feel, yeah, I feel like when, um, I think when, when you, when blast was like kind of redesigning what the app did and, and Patrick was there, I was just really familiar about what you're trying to measure and how. So that really resonated with me. So, um, it was like, Hey, I've had this idea in my mind and I was teaching this thing for a long time. And now I just had a way to, to measure it and track what players was doing. So that was the first thing that was very useful to me in a way where I felt like I could see what the player's swing path was doing and then I could see what they were doing on video and the field and I could come up with interventions and drills 
that were able to um, like alter players swing path in a way that either produce not just contact, but quality contact, more power, reduce strikeout rate, improve contact rate, things like that. Um, there's a pretty good list of players with that. That's the, the, the 2017, uh, Colin Moran, Tony Kemp, JD Davis, Derek Fisher was in that group. He was a first round pick. Um, I feel like I'm missing somebody on there, but there was a pretty good crew of guys that were there, um, that really working with them, you know, they really taught me a lot about the application process. So that one's like near and dear to my heart. I think as I've gone along, you know, um, you know, obviously tracking bat speed, learning more about rotational acceleration. So that combination of, you know, you can accelerate quickly and that doesn't necessarily mean you have bat speed or you can have bat speed, but that doesn't mean you're a great accelerator. So understanding the combination of bat speed and the power, the time component, I probably paid a little bit more attention to those now than I was early on. Um, and then, like I said, I, like I, I'll look at the early connection and connection impact um, to just tell where the bat angle is attack angle, like what's your direction to the ball. So, I mean, there's a bunch of them. I think I have it. I mean, so there's my TV. So you're yeah. hitting in the cage and you take some swings, you got your blast on. So I usually have it up on, on there like that. So the bat speed, uh, rotational acceleration, on plane efficiency, attack angle, early connection and vertical bat angle. Those are probably my big six that I leave up on the, uh, the metrics board for the most part. Awesome. Yeah, those are the ones we talked to too. It's been so cool to see this uh, progress over the years and you've been such a big part of it. So we really appreciate you there. Last question, uh, one tip of advice for people working in small groups and then one piece of advice for people in larger organizations, uh, just on the way you go about it or something to think too. We just get a lot of questions on this, You know, the difference between working in a small group versus running an organization any last thoughts on that before we let you go with uh, your day yeah so i mean I, i'm in all of those right so you have yeah. time in spring training or instructional league where you have a big group you know we're in small groups all the time from two to four to six in the cage in this um you know atmosphere right here like uh i like groups of four players um what i really like early on is the assessment or the individual work so then we can figure out Hey, what are the drills that are good for you and kind of coach those up? And then once the players have those individual concepts, it's a lot easier to break up into the, the group setting where you can create in that setting, say we got different drills or stations, you've got a drill, especially for that player. Um, and you can kind of plug them in and you're hitting with that, you're hitting them with like a coaching point that you've already taken the time to explain versus, you know, you're trying to deliver this individual coaching in a group setting. So I think on both ends, this is kind of advice for both. Be intentional about if you have a uh, use your kind of one on one time to kind of do that, like teaching. And then you also want a group setting where you can get more of the action that almost more reminders. And, you know, again, you've got your implicit drills, things like that. So, for example, in here, I'll, we'll have players come in, do the one on one and visual assessment first. And then when they come, then we'll plug them into small groups with different stations. So in the cage, there might be the machine. You can see over like over here, there's a little device for swing pass. So the drills might be set up to touch. Um, if there's four players, for example, a typical day might be there's one drill that's designed for swing pass. There's another one that's designed for rotation. There's another one that's designed for speed. And then you're trying to plug those. You, you're almost, it's, a, it's part practice that you're almost trying to like add up the pieces and then plug into, you got someone throwing to you, things like that. So again, that goes back into practice design and, and, uh, and taking the part practices and, and trying to hit each area. And then um, I think this is a big point on that, whether you're in an individual group or a large group is you want those movement things, you want those drills, but they all have to be aimed at transfer back to the field. So there's no soft toss competition. There's no hit off the tee competition. Um, where is the player in the process, progression, regression? So where are you going to meet them? What are you going to teach them? And what's your plan to progress that into on-game field performance? So I think if you kind of have that mindset, then you can go at your either group or individual, individual sessions in a way to kind of set those up because I want the, all those things in alignment. So I'm working with you and we're doing a one-on-one. -on -one. We're doing in the, that one-on-one -on -one so you understand what to do and how. So now when you get plugged into the group and the rotation and the different drills, your understanding goes up. 
but maybe I'm in, you know, doing a drill with another player, but I can see you and remind you to keep your hands up or to whatever it is, stay above the ball more, whatever the thing that is that you're working on. Um, so that helps both the individual and the group session and accelerate the learning process for me. That is awesome. We covered a lot of great topics and I love that you landed right kind of where we started with kind of the workout example of being able to scale it up and down to that competitive level sure. and kind of get everything going there with the training environments. Uh, if you want to learn more, hittingresearch.com, hit 585 or follow Jeff Albert on Twitter. It is a great follow. I highly suggest that you do it. Are there any other ways that people can get information from you or things that you want to share before we sign off? No, you hit it. That's the big ones. Website, social media, you know, I'm on there. So you can find me there. Awesome. Jeff, thank you so much for your time today. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Thanks for having me on. Happy to see what you guys are doing.